Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all our viewers. My name is Samantha Castle and I'm the Senior Manager for Alumni Relations at the University of Pretoria. Today, we are proud to present our second edition of our Global Alumni Virtual Chat. You will recall that at the end of May, we had the first edition of the series where we spoke to alumni living in New York, London, Chengdu, and Melbourne. In today's discussion, we speak to alumni living in Botswana, Kenya, Namibia, and Nigeria, and they will share their thoughts about how life under lockdown has been for them and their families. Natabale Matela, who is an award-winning Radio Metro, Metro FM personality and proud UP graduate, will be our moderator for this evening. Thank you so much for all your support. We notice all your comments, your likes, your supports, your views in the slido.com. We thank you for that. Without any further ado, allow me to introduce our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Tawana Kupe, to say a few words of welcome to you. From Kupe, a very good evening to all our alumni across the African continent, uh, from the southern tip to the west and all the way up north. I'm Joanna Kupe, Vice Chancellor and Principal. I just, uh, before we started this webinar, came off the webinar uh, of the African Alliance Partners. This is 10 African universities, including the University of Victoria. Together with Michigan State University in the US. And one of the panelists there, who didn't even know that I was today, spoke about where this panelist is from the Carnegie Corporation of Europe. It supports a lot of our education and funding. Then I heard they say that you know, the University of Victoria is a future oriented and African university okay, that practices post order knowledge production and education and transdisciplinary research. And, and that this is the university to do. So I welcome all of you, your freedom or your alumni of the University of Victoria. And before I go any further, let me observe a moment of protocol. Any sort of justice to hold yourself from the media, all protocol of death. Thank you for coming in. I know how busy you are. Let me say also in this regard, Minister of Justice in South Africa is the UP the alumni as well. So I think also UP, in a sense, uh, rules in the field of justice. We also have a leading center of human rights, the leading center for child law. Our faculty of law is in the top 100 in world ranking. So is our faculty of veterinary science, the only one in South Africa. And our uh, business school, Oral Institute of Business Science, has just been ranked number 53 in the world in the military education. So we are graduates of a very uh, uh, important university in the middle. Number of our professors in the law field also has just been appointed to international commission. Professor Jire, Professor Ito Haines, has produced a wonderful report on use of force uh, by uh, security forces all over the world for the second I would like also to tell you that something has happened in the last two, three years, especially culminating in that field. We have launched three innovation platforms the Future Africa Institute to address complex problems of Africa using knowledge. We have launched engineering 4.0, all things digital in the terms of domain. We launched a new museum for the art of Africa. It also holds the Makumbu Collection. It is a very large uh, uh, art center with nine galleries inside the museum. We are also busy in uh, uh, launching a new institute called Innovation Africa at This will be digital interpretation and advertising. Agriculture, food security, all of these things are important in our continent. And last night I was reviewing documents about this year upcoming new institute, and it's going to be really, really very fantastic, future oriented as well. I want also to assure you that you see the men that took the visitor of people in South Africa, and therefore probably on the whole continent, and that also, despite COVID, we've managed to launch online teaching and learning much teaching and learning, provided students with their laptops and devices, and that is going so well. Students are now writing exams, which they are doing online. 
only a few examples of the European Union traditional group. I would like to thank Evelyn, the moderator for this uh, the role tonight for our alumni. Thank you very much. We're proud of you as our alumni. And thank also the moderator. And then thank Sam, uh, Kasli, and the alumni relations for mounting these, uh, these sessions. I have lost count now, but I think I've attended all of them. Thank you very much. Let's enjoy. Let's go. Thank you, Prof. Kupe. Yes, indeed, we've had many of these discussions, and we look forward to this evening's discussions with our panelists. So to all our viewers, don't forget to join us for our next Lead UP Alumni Career Chats, which will take place next Wednesday and the 15th of July from 12 till 1 p.m. And we will speak to talent specialists from different corporate companies um, about how to build our career strategy in today's job market. So please don't forget to join in for that discussion. Um, we look forward to all your comments and your views and your likes uh, in our live comment sections, as well as going to slido.com, where you will participate in the polling session for us. Thank you so much. Over to you, Nabtabaleng, and let's have a wonderful, fruitful discussion this evening. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Samantha. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. My name is Ntabaleng Madela, and as mentioned by Sam, I am a Metro FM Radio presenter as well as a DJ, but most importantly, I myself am also a graduate of the University of Pretoria. So it is a really great pleasure for me to be your host this evening. Now, with any, uh, without any further ado, I'd really like to say welcome to the LEAD Global Alumni Virtual Chat. Uh, this evening, we will be having a very interesting discussion. It is, of course, our second one uh, where we will be discussing global lockdowns. Are we learning, thriving, or just surviving? Uh, I'm very honored as well to be joined by a panel of alumni from our very own African continent. Today, I'm joined by alumni from Nigeria, Namibia, Kenya, as well as Botswana. Um, I look forward to learning from each of them as they each share their respective experiences as they're all in different cities across the continent. As well as part of the discussion, we'll also be looking at some of the social, economic and political norms that each of them have had to adapt to. We hope that by the end of this session, you know, you will have a sense of how your peers, you know, across the continent have learned, thrived, or perhaps have just made it through day by day. Uh, also, what you can do to utilize your UP education to grow and succeed further. And lastly, we also hope that you will be able to get a sense of some of the nuances around the African continent uh, that are currently being faced by our respective panelists. And of course, this event is brought to you by the University of Pretoria, and our panelists will be joining us as alumni of the University of Pretoria, as I myself am proud to be a part of that. So without any further ado, let us welcome our speakers. Uh, the first up, I have an amazing gentleman who happens to be a development consultant uh, who is joining us all the way from Nigeria. Uh, can we please welcome Mr. Chinedu Ngwagu, sir? Hello, good to see you and great to, great to be on the panel. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, so for everybody at home, just so that they know, uh, Mr. Chinedu is a good governance and human rights advocate and for nearly two decades now uh, has worked actively in the reformation of justice sector in Nigeria. He's also recently served as a Trust Africa's project director for for anti-corruption and criminal justice in Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Chinedu, anything you'd like to say to greet everybody at home? Hello, everybody. Hope you're keeping safe and uh, staying well and surviving the many phases of the lockdown wherever you are and doing the best of the season. Thank you so much, Chinedu. Thank you so much. We look forward to hearing from you. Uh, next up, allow me to introduce our next panelist. Uh, she's an agricultural economist who is joining us all the way from Kenya. We have Dr. Rosemary Imengo. How are you, Dr. Rosemary? I'm well. I'm well, my dear. Happy I'm very to happy to have you. I'm so yeah. happy that you're happy to be 
as well. Uh, so for everybody, uh, Dr. Rosemary is a principal research scientist at the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock Research Organization. She's also a board member of the Kenya National Innovation Agency, and she has held this position since July 2015. Dr. Rosemary, any words of greeting to our audience? I'm glad. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you'll enjoy the talk. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And then up next, allow me to introduce our next panelist. He is a laboratory specialist uh, who's joining us all the way from Botswana. Mr. Newton Runyangwa, how are you? I'm all right. Greetings, everyone. Lovely to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so you happen to be a medical scientist with 18 years of experience in the international health development, public and private health care. And you've run a couple of clinical trials researches as well. You've also recently been awarded a master's degree in development practice. That's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Mr. Newton, anything you'd like to say to greet the audience at home? Welcome, everyone. I hope you are keeping safe. Uh, during this COVID time. Great to have you here. Thank you so much, Mr. Newton. And last but certainly not least, we are very honored uh, to be joined by the Minister of Justice in Namibia, uh, Minister Yvonne Dwasab. How are you, Minister Yvonne? I'm very well, and I'm delighted to join the panel. I'm so happy to have you on the panel as well. So for everyone at home, um, Minister Yvonne is an admitted legal practitioner of the High Court of Namibia, and she has served in this capacity since the year 2000. She began her term as Minister of Justice in Namibia in March 2020. But before that, she was chairperson of the Law Reform and Development Commission. Uh, Minister Yvonne, any words of greeting to everyone tuned in? Well, thank you very much for joining us and we're excited about the experiences that we'll share with you. Thank you so much. You. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our very amazing panel. Uh, looking forward to the discussion that we're about to have. Uh, but just to let you know, throughout the discussion, you are welcome to post any questions by using Slido. We'll just need you to use hashtag lead UP uh, 8 July. You can post all of your questions there. And also we will be having uh, about three polls that will be running throughout the session and we'll need you to just cast your vote there as well. So I think before we actually start our panel discussion, let's quickly start with our first poll for this evening. And you can please just remember to submit your answers on Slido using hashtag lead UP 8 July. So the first poll, the question is, would you like to hear more stories from UP alumni across Africa? Yes, I'd like to learn more or no, thank you. Thank you. Cool, so while you are posting your votes, uh, let's get straight into the discussion. Uh, let's start off with the first question that I'd like to post to each of you. Um, how long have you been living in the city that you're currently in right now? And how would you describe the lockdown regulations where you are compared to those of South Africa right now? Uh, Mr. Chinedu, perhaps we can start with you in Nigeria. Thank you. Um, so I live in Abuja, the capital of uh, huh? Nigeria. And I've been here uh, for 10 years now, actually, since I graduated from the University of Pretoria. I then moved to Abuja. So I've been here for 10 years. Um, in Nigeria, the lockdown was mostly Abuja and Lagos, and then one other state, Lisbon State. Um, the first two phases of it were very similar to South Africa. There was a complete shutdown of, uh, of the space. The movement was restricted and... Um, I mean, it was, it was a complete shutdown for everything, you know, but for economic reasons also, we've had to ease it up a little bit. Okay, thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Mary, from you in Kenya? Yeah, uh, I've, I live in Nairobi, Kenya, where mm -hmm. I have lived for the last over 20 years since I graduated in 1988. I've just been here. I only oh. go away. Like the time I came to South Africa to do my PhD, but uh, I come back here. So we have had a, a partial, a lockdown for Nairobi, Mombasa, and uh, some other towns, Kilifi and Kuala. 
and Mandera, the areas where they, they were uh, deemed to be hot spots, yeah? And also we have a curfew. Mm -hmm. So I think I was, wasn't really completely a lockdown. Uh, and I think that will be, it's better for us because our economy is a bit um, dependent on people, especially in the city mm -hmm. who go to work for a daily wage and then come home and feed their families. But uh, the lockdown, the, 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 the curfew was a bit uh, stringent in the beginning because it was starting at seven and ending at five. So many people were not able to do their work properly. Yeah, but uh, otherwise, uh, sure. other things were going on, and uh, transport was also still on, but uh, there was social distancing in the public transport, whereby well, if a vehicle is supposed to carry like 14 people, it will only carry like seven or so. So I think the uh, operators mm -hmm. of those vehicles, they transfer the cost to the, to the travelers by increasing the cost of transport. Yeah. Sure. Wow, yeah. that's quite interesting. And yourself, Mr. Newton, how long have you been living in the city that you're currently in? And how would you describe the lockdown regulations right now compared to those of South Africa? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, I've been living in Kaboroni since 2006. That's about 14 years now since I moved from, mm -hmm. uh, from Harare, Zimbabwe. Uh, and currently, lockdown uh, regulations have been lifted. We were under a serious lockdown probably for about four to six weeks. And we also had some phases the same way with, with South Africa. However, business activity has, has resumed. Uh, shopping malls, hotels, schools have reopened. Although there is strict compliance with the health regulations, hand washing, uh, social distancing, wear, wearing face coverings, uh, registration for, for contact tracing uh, in, in, in business premises, temperature monitoring, those things are still happening. Um, Cross-border travel is still, and air travel, uh, not yet, uh, not yet resumed. So probably the country relies on tourism, I think is the second uh, foreign income in, uh, uh, after, after mining, and I hope probably in the pipeline, there will be plans to, to, to resume uh, air travel soon, yeah. Okay, thank you so much for that, um, Mr. Newton. Uh, Stay, Yvonne, from you all the way in Namibia. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, for us, uh, because of our history with South Africa, uh, there are some similarities, but there are also some differences. I've lived in uh, Ventuk, Namibia since birth, since 1974. So I've been in this particular city um, uh, for this six year. Of course, that that. That is um, also, I've, I've, I've lived in Zambia for a short while. I've been in South Africa while I was studying the initiative and so forth. So, but in terms of uh, being here, I've been here since birth. Uh, just in terms of, of our process in Namibia when it comes to the, the um, lockdown regulations, is that we declared a state of emergency. And, and our work uh, and our declaration of the state of emergency was done under our constitution. Um, unlike in South Africa, which was done under, I think, disaster risk management and so forth, ours is done under the Constitution. The second thing about our lockdown, which is slightly different, is the fact that we, the president, actually, you know, I know South Africa, it's also the same, but the president is responsible for, for, for the regulations, and he does that in, in consultation with cabinet. Uh, we also have an additional requirement that once the president has declared a state of emergency, he must submit it to the National Assembly for approval. And he must do so continuously throughout the state of emergency. Um, you know, they need to continuously approve the various proclamations and regulations that are passed throughout. You can imagine we've had, we've set out five stages of, of this process. Stage one was lockdown. We are no longer in lockdown, but we remain in a state of emergency. Yeah. And then what has happened is we've done our stages and the migration from one stage to the next, we've done it, um, you know, within the framework of a 20 day, you know, uh, period. So two incubation periods we've used. We are now in, in, in 13 regions of Namibia, we are in stage four, um, but there is a localized area that has kind of been 
um, that has less, that has more restrictions because our COVID-19 cases uh, are starting to grow quite exponentially in that particular area. So there is a region that has been isolated. In Namibia, we have no deaths, thank God. Um, but we have, uh, today, as of today, we have 593 coronavirus uh, confirmed cases. 25 of them um, have, have, have recovered. So, so that's the situation in which we find ourselves. I do want to say two more things, and that is that in, in, in Namibia, uh, the, the moment we migrate from one stage to the next, you know, we have uh, certain restrictions at the moment throughout the country, similar to what is happening with Newton in, in, in Botswana. We have uh, uh, some restrictions at the moment, everyone must wear a mask when you're in public and if you are in any public space and if you are meeting people, um, everyone must maintain social distancing of at least one meter. Um, there is, of course, a very vigorous um, requirement to disinfect if you're going to open up. So our economy is open um, with, with those restrictions. Let me pause there for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Minister, for that. Um, and then the next question I have, apart from working from home, what else have you been doing during lockdown? Uh, Dr. Miri, I know that you're a parent yourself, so what are some of the other things that you've had to face, uh, you know, during the lockdown time, apart from working from home? Yeah, we had to observe these uh, COVID-19 uh, restrictions like you must wear a, a, a mask in the public, you must social distance, there must not be unnecessary meetings. We have had to learn to do Zoom meetings, even official ones. They worked around it until they had to create some laws to allow that kind of thing to happen. Uh, schools, of course, have been closed and uh, universities, colleges, we have children at home. Uh, as much as we are working at home, the children are also not going to school. The public transport system, like the taxis, they are also affected because now when many people are at home, no, no one was using them. So definitely there are so many people who have had uh, some bad impacts from COVID-19. But yes. on the positive side, we have had reduction in pollution. Like where I live here, when I'm going to work in a normal day, when the traffic is usual, it takes me an hour to get there or more. But when there was this issue of COVID, 10 minutes I'd be at the workspace. Uh, that time I was still uh, going to work. Uh, the government has helped mm -hmm. by reducing taxations. They reduce the income tax uh, rates and also the VAT rates. So people are to enable people to have some more money in their pockets. Uh, we have seen that uh, in Kenya, many people came up to innovate. For example, they created uh, machines to wash hands. Uh, they started making uh, sanitizers. They began to, you know, to make uh, ventilators. The, I see that the innovative spirit of the people was uh, showcased in this case, yeah? And uh, now because the borders were closed, people are making their own things like swabs and what have you. So I think what we need to do is to encourage the people to continue you know, with these innovations instead of us always trying to import from other places like China and what have you. In the, in the judiciary system, like what uh, the minister has said, they have now created a portal for them to be able to lodge their cases online because even the courts were closed and the, there was a lockdown of uh, court cases. So they were only now doing only the very, very essential ones and even online. So I think all in all, there are some good things that came out of this lockdown. Mm. Uh, our lockdown was brought about by the, uh, I think, Public Health Act. It's not a, a state of emergency. Public Health Act was used to create the lockdown, quarantines, you know, like people coming in and you are taking quarantine if you are testing positive. The quarantine was a bit of a, an issue for people because uh, some of them got mental issues, problems. You know, when you are locked up alone in a place, no one, no relative to come and see you, couldn't yes. call. Some of them uh, got very, uh, very ruffled up. 
we have seen that uh, in our in our space here yeah, we have had increasing domestic violence you know against women sure. and ag <laughs> against children i think because of uh, people you know staying in the home the whole day looking at each other if you didn't like each other now you have to spend the whole day together for weeks and days there was a problem yeah that, that that's very problematic. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Rosemary. Um, and Mr. Newton, yourself, you know, apart from working from home, what else have you been doing during lockdown? Uh, well, uh, I didn't stop going to work, although you, you had the option to, you know, most most days work from home. Uh, but what yes. is that we really had to, to, to take on? Um, from the virtual meetings uh, also you have to embrace uh, um, online learning opportunities because now we had access to more more trainings more more meetings available and they were free online i hope it will continue post post covid nice yeah nice thank you so much thank you. um mr Tenegu, if i was to ask you what have been the best and the worst changes you know, that have been brought about by lockdown in your life specifically? Being in Nigeria. Um, let's get the bad news first. Um, so like my colleagues have said, um, for Nigeria, there's been a spike of uh, gender-based violence. I mean, the numbers are just ridiculous uh, in these times. Uh, so been, you know, um, it shows how much of uh, uh, of a support structure we don't have within the society, you know, particularly for the poor in times of emergencies uh, like this, um, and, and then how much of our businesses are, de are dependent on the day-to-day -day activities. People basically live from, from hand to hand, and and they were the most affected during this time. But on the positive side, um, we uh, the, the lock the lockdown and the whole crisis basically helped us shift the excesses. So we came down to the physics and actually what I need for survival. Uh, so you, it was easier to identify the essentials. Uh, we also saw a spike in people who had attention to and to their health. Um, uh, uh, most people added a few a few kgs in the first one or two weeks, but then also people started exercising. So even though the, the city was locked down, you will see pockets of you know people exercising within certain spaces. So there was also an increase in that. And then for those that have families, and uh, it was also an opportunity to sit back and spend some quality time with your loved ones. The degree to which people were able to maximize that also is debatable, but that was, that was part of the, the major um, schools were shut down. So the kids were home and spouses were home and family members were home. So it was, it was also good to spend time with family and to see each other for longer than the few hours we usually do. Okay, thank you so much for that, Mr. Chinedu. Um, I've just received a very first poll results. Would you like to hear more stories from the UP alumni across Africa? And 100% of you said yes, which is absolutely great. Uh, so before we move on to the next poll, um, Minister Yvonne, I'd also just like to hear from you, what have been some of the best and the worst changes that have been necessitized by lockdown for you in Namibia? I think a number of things. One of it, obviously, is the fact that you had um, you had to work at a speed as government, and and also it required a lot of collective thinking uh, of cabinet members. It it meant that there was increased public engagement, at least on our part, and and it required you to be aware of everything that was happening. So you couldn't just say, you know, I'm the Minister of Justice and therefore I will not deal with issues of trade or issues of tourism. So that I think was good. It also increased uh, some of the good things. Um, it increased a lot of uh, knowledge in, in various aspects of social life. You know, you, you needed to really remain engaged, particularly as a member of cabinet. Um, and I think that was a good thing. What the other thing that it did that I think was good is is the fact that it it, it government had to uh, really deliver some public services at a speed of light, and 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 I think uh, that was good because it it really 
propelled us into accelerating public service delivery. Um, some of the uh, initial things that we did um, as a government is, is the emergency income grant that we had. We also had a, a, a social uh, security kind of funding available for employers. You know, we wanted to mitigate the impact. So, so some of the best things for me, apart from what Chinedi was saying um, at, at a personal level, you know, you had more time for reading, for example, you had more time to spend with your family, um, but also it, it allowed you time to reflect on on what, what the quality of life that you are living, I suppose, yeah. as, as a human being. Some of the, I think for me, maybe the, the, the more bad things that it did is that it created a, a great sense of aloofness, um, you know, because you, you focus a lot more on complying with the regulations. So maintaining social distancing, and you were even forgetting this when you were visiting your mom to give her a hug because you were so focused. So your life became a little bit clinical, I think, but something that is not something that we can conceive as Africans because we are very warm people and we are committed people and it made it very uncomfortable that sense of aloofness that one started to feel um yeah, i think that for me is what what was necessary the the other things i think is, is the fact that we were also in a way and i must admit this um as a member of the executive it, it was also starting to um expose a little bit you know some of the difficulties that we were experiencing things were a little bit more magnified um you know it was kind of in your face you know because of lockdown so so what i think um you know a lockdown is done we are no longer in lockdown in namibia of course we're in stage four uh you know but but during this state of emergency there is a lot of pressure um on on government to deliver particularly on on socioeconomic issues No, no sound. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Minister Yvonne. That then round up the first round of questions. It's now time to take our second poll. So the second poll is, do you have any interest in connecting with alumni in your part of the world? Options being yes, I do, or no, I'm not interested. Thank you. Um, so while you are busy putting your answers in on that, I think it's important that we move on to the second round of questions, uh, also just being very cautious of our time. So the first question that I have uh, for you as a panel is, what are some of the key lessons that you have learned during the COVID-19 pandemic? Mr. Newton, perhaps we can start with you. Well, for, for me, the biggest lesson is that Everyone is responsible for the future of all of us. I mean, you 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 can you can do everything you can, but if the next person is not also playing their part, it's going to be difficult for us to to to, to achieve in this. Um, also, as a as a as a laboratory professional, I've learned that uh, there, there is really a lot of uh, work that needs to be done, especially in Africa and in, in developing countries, uh, especially to to build. Uh, laboratory systems and networks so that we can have the capacity and capability to deal with uh, pandemics like 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 COVID-19. And I think those are the two biggest lessons that I've, I've, I've learned from this. Thank you so much. Um, Minister Yvonne, I actually have a question that we've just received on Slido uh, that says, Congratulations on the zero deaths in Namibia and the lower active cases. To what extent do you believe that this is sustainable? Can you perhaps share with us some key principles that Namibia has adopted to remain um, at this relative low performance compared to the rest of the world? Yes, no, thank you very much for that question and an important one. 
the, one of the first things that Namibia did is at the at the once we learned that there were two cases, positive cases in Namibia, uh, you know, we declared a state of emergency. And what we also did is we localized uh, and re restrictions. In other words, the moment we identified where those cases were, we we locked them down. At the time, it was um, the capital um, and two of the main ones where the problem is currently. So, so that for me is the first thing that we I think we did right. The, the second thing uh, that we did right is is that we provided some uh, you know some package and support to to the vulnerable communities of of our society, um, and then then uh, so that we could manage. You know, so that we could avoid hunger poverty, as it were, um, right at the beginning. The third thing that I think we did well um, is that we, you know, continuously uh, watched what was going on where, and and we responded uh, with speed. What we also did is we had a coalition. Apart from the fact that it's the president and the cabinet that manages social, uh, you know, uh, states of emergencies in, in Namibia, one of the other things that we did is we had a coalition or a, a network of experts that we brought together that met once a week to discuss how do we uh, manage the crisis, and 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 so. I think, uh, apart from declaring a, a state of emergency right at the beginning, the the engagement we had with the public and civil society and experts that also helped because they were then able to um, tell us uh, what to do next. I mean, we are now finding ourselves in in a situation where we have 593 still compared to other jurisdictions a very low rate, um, but I think we mm -hmm. need. We need to now really think about uh, how do we contain the further spread of, of the virus. And what we've now done is to kind of lock down um, so there's no exit and movement into those particular areas where we've identified um, the, the, the where the virus is really uh, growing quite seriously. We've been concerned about community uh, transmission. And, and, and that's what we're finding now. But what we're able to identify is that most of the contacts uh, that are causing the, the virus to grow now are still the same ones that were identified initially. So we're still a little bit we can do more uh, to contain the further spread of the virus. Sure. Thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Minister Yvonne. Um, and then, uh, uh, Mr. Chinedu, could you perhaps share with us um, what are some of the changes that you have made now during lockdown that you potentially plan to stick to once things actually get back to some sort of normality? Um, I think the first point, it's uh, professionally, um, the fact that uh, in the civil society space where I work, we would have to rethink our rules of engagement and strategies, you know, um, instead of the usual convenings and conferences and, and whatnot, uh, advocacy strategies have, would have to change and we would, you know, have to find new ways of engaging both with the citizenry and the government, you know, uh, particularly in the light of the development of the times. Um, but beyond that also, it's important that uh, part of what we have thrown up is uh, the most vulnerable parts of our engagement as a society. Um, attention has to be given now to the health sector, the education sector, and, you know, um, employment skills needed in these times. A lot of jobs have, have you know, uh, people have lost jobs, businesses have shut down, you know, so the skills needed in the public sector and the private sector, you know, for people to stay employed have to change, you know, in these times. And so we also need to turn our attention to that and yes. you know, ensure that those gaps are filled as much as possible. As personally, um, like uh, like Yvonne said, it's you know it's been a time for reflection and a time for you know assessing your quality of life. You know, so um, the exercise regimens and attempts at eating healthy, we would uh, try and maintain those as much as possible after the lockdown. Yes. Yes, thank you so much for that, um, Mr. Chinedu. And um, Dr. Rosemary, um, I'd like to ask you, what is your view of the impact of COVID-19 on the economy of Kenya as it stands? Uh, 
Dr. Rosemary, you're currently on mute. Can you just unmute your mic for us, please? Thank yes, you. Yes, I was saying that uh, we have had uh, negative impacts on the economy. First of all, many companies have, have had to lay off workers. And so there are people who are jobless, increasing now the numbers of the unemployed people. And uh, the effect of that is that uh, I think uh, the poverty levels of some households have gone up, which has made it necessary for the government to uh, provide transfers, mm. both ca uh, uh, cash and food to the, to, the, uh, to the vulnerable communities, the poor people, the ones I talked about who earn uh, a daily wage. And when the, there are lockdowns, our lockdown actually for Nairobi and Mombasa and the other towns was ended a day or so ago. Not that the numbers had mm. reduced, the numbers are still going up, but it was more risky to keep this economy. Okay. Uh, we seem to have lost Dr. Rosemary there for a bit. Uh, Mr. Newton, what's your take on the impact of COVID-19 on your economy as it stands right now in Botswana? Well, uh, for, for me, um, only, only the healthy can, can positively contribute to any economy. And uh, as a healthcare worker, is, you, you, we think of health before, before wealth. But overall, it has been a, I think it's a reflective opportunity to 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 reflect on on the economic models both at a household level in a community and also at a national level uh also to like uh for example in the in the in the covid response we have seen that um it's important for us to have local productive capacity you know there has been disruption yes. to supply chains and, and without local production, it's difficult to get medical supplies, to get uh, protective equipment, to get, to get uh, uh, diagnostics, and all other necessary requirements. So I think it's an opportunity to, to, to leverage on, on our local uh, uh, institutions, research and economic institutions, yes. and also the capacity of our local economies. I think like the minister has shared before, well, because it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's both a health problem and also a social economic problem. You also realize that the issues around basic infrastructure, you know, uh, access to water, sanitation, housing, uh, these are issues that are, are well articulated in the sustainable development goals. And I think we are we, we just started off in the decade of action for the sustainable development for Agenda 2030. And it's, it's, it's an opportune moment to, to, to address uh, aggressively some of these issues that are affecting uh, uh, the, the, the economic and social development of our people. And it has been a steep because it's the first time that everyone has gone through this. Uh, but for, for, for me, I think some of, the, some of the measures that we have, for example, it might be difficult or impractical for someone to observe uh, social distancing when you, when you share a room, 15, 20 people share a room. And so, so those are the realities that we have. I think we have to prioritize sustainable development as Africans and also as, as, as governments and all over the world. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Newton. Yes, uh, Minister Yvonne, would you like to add to that? Yes, I, yes, I do want to add maybe just a couple of points. The, the, the one is in, in Namibia, uh, when, when the Minister of Finance um, submitted his budget to the National Assembly, he, he said four things. He said, we want to save lives, we want to save livelihoods, we want to save jobs, and, and we want to, to save income. And, and that was really the philosophical anchor of, of our budget. And so uh, the bulk of the money really went to, uh, you know, certain sectors, education, uh, health and tourism were some of them, but also the areas where government wanted to inject some support was in construction, uh, tourism, um, and so on. So uh, you know, so so that was that 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 was the thinking then. But of course, 
our economy is also hard hit because what is happening now, and now with the increase of coronavirus cases in that particular local authority areas that have been identified um, in Namibia as being problematic, if you want, is is the fact that we needed to, we needed to now. Uh, increase the funding for the Ministry of Health so that they can contain um, the spread of the virus. We are seeing, regrettably, we are seeing an increase in a number of people that are losing jobs. The Minister of Labour uh, was just making, an employment creation was making a statement earlier today in the National Assembly. It's a huge, huge chunk of people that will lose jobs. But And, and I think we need to think about how do we kickstart the economy in a way that we can get back to a comfortable place. It's, it's a very uneasy place. Namibia finds itself like many other jurisdictions, but I think what we needed to think about, and I see there's a question about what are the factors that you need to consider, is, is the mm. fact that someone said you can, you can find time, whether you do it over a period of time between now and the next two years, you can start to do things that will uh, bring back the economy to some kind of life, but you cannot uh, bring back people that die. And I think we need to, to really balance um, the, the issue of saving lives and, and, and really restoring um, you know, the economy to a place uh, of comfort for the country. So we understand that it's a delicate balance um, and an important one, but we need to understand why we are finding ourselves in the place that we find ourselves. One of the things that Namibia wants to do now from 15 July to August 15 is to try and open up the borders because they are closed at the moment to certain jurisdictions mm -hmm. that we think we can comfortably handle um, they, them coming back. So the tourism sector and hospitality sector is thinking about ways of injecting some capital or some life in the tourism tourism sector. Thank you so much for that, uh, Minister. Um, Mr. Shinedu, you have a question here come on Slido that asks, how has the government in Nigeria gone about making its decisions uh, during this pandemic? Have the civil society organizations and citizens been engaged? Uh, that's a question from Kaya. Uh, thank you, Kaya. Well, um, there's a presidential task force uh, that's responsible for monitoring the, the trends of the epidemic of, of the pandemic in Nigeria and reporting to the president. And they also coordinate engagement with various stakeholders. Um, part of the initial response we saw was uh, multiple donations from the private sector, especially towards a, a consolidated fund. So, uh, you know, uh, address responses uh, to COVID. Civil society also chipped in. Quite a number of the donors in the country were able to, you know, uh, make donations, philanthropic donations towards, you know, uh, testing, response, you know, and coordination uh, across board. And um, the disease control uh, 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 center has also uh, been engaging citizens. Uh, almost every day you get a text message or some form of notification briefing you of recent measures, the current numbers and the statistics and the trends and what needs to be done. Um, and then there are also engagements with the sectors most affected. For example, religious bodies uh, get to meet with the tax force and, and they together come up with policies, you know, to guide, you know, the conduct of affairs during the lockdown and as the lockdown has continued to ease. And so in all, it's been consultative, fair enough. Uh, we would score them um, fairly in that regard. Um, and it's been carried along. Uh, is it as comprehensive as it could be? No, the, the, the part of the, the, the outcome of this is it, it showed us the weaknesses within the system already, you know, they were just amplified by the crisis. And uh, I think uh, it behooves on us now to find ways of addressing them going forward. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chinedu. Um, Minister of Justice, uh, all the way in Namibia, I think it's fair to say that, you know, Namibia has certainly uh, showed that you had a sense of control over the pandemic versus how we as South Africa have really, really battled. I have a question here from Kaya that's saying, what lessons has Namibia's National Assembly learned from what has actually happened in South Africa and how our government has responded? I think um, in terms of lessons learned uh, from the National Assembly, it is really just open communication 
and and providing constant feedback. One of the things that Namibia did right, I think, and and I see that with South Africa as well, is that there is we have a what we call a COVID nineteen update center. We created a communication center where various people from all walks of life give an opportunity to come and speak um, about the various experiences that we had. We've even had an assessment of the impact of that communication center on the lives uh, of people in terms of communication. And that platform has been open for people to even criticize, you know, and, and, and complain about issues that they may have had difficulties with. We've had a case uh, in court, which we lost, uh, just by the way, um, that, that, that an employer's association has taken government to court for a, a, you know, a guideline where we were encouraging employers to, instead of retrenching and dismissing people, to, to create a platform for social dialogue so that we can find ways of addressing the concern. You know, we did not want a situation, at least as government, and that was our thinking. Uh, we did not have a situation where uh, where, where you, you're already in lockdown, you're in a state of emergency, you, you're scared, you, there's lots of uncertainties about coronavirus and, and how long it will be with us, and, and, and you still had to be found unemployed without income. We did not want that. Um, but the but we also understood that you know there was you know people maybe could not continue paying when they were not making um, the 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 kind of income that they were used to. So so we understood that. But we were saying you know let's not push people into the streets. Let's rather find a, a common ground to to address those concerns. So to to answer the question really. Uh, is for us, I think we have consistent, the lesson is we have had uh, very clear laws about how we wanted to manage the crisis and, and we communicated that intention of those laws uh, to members of the public. So the members of the public were able to engage the text of the laws in, in, in the manner in which they were uh, interacting uh, with government. There are some things I think we could have done differently uh, you know, but but it's a learning curve, you know, and you learn as you as you go along. No, no, no one of us have, have managed a crisis like this. So um, it certainly helped that we were allowing uh, civil society organizations and experts to be part of, of our decision making arrangement. Thank you so much for that, uh, Minister Yvonne. Uh, so I've just received uh, the last poll results that we ran. Do you have any interest in connecting with alumni in your part of the world? And 100% said, yes, I do. So uh, that pretty much wraps up the questions that we have for this evening. But I guess just on a lighter note, Mr. Newton, what would you say was your fondest memory of Tux being at the University of Pretoria? Well, for me, for me, the opportunity, the opportunity to learn my first attempt to 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 join tax or to learn a tax was in 2011. But I had recently had a job change, so I didn't manage to 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 continue with my program. So enrolling for for the MPhil in development practice was really a, a good opportunity for me because of the way the the program was structured. It could allow me to take study leave and then be able to attend class. But I think the most memorable part was learning out of the Future Africa campus. It's a beautiful campus uh, just after the university farm. And uh, and Prof. Kupe was also talking about the engineering 4.0 campus, also close to that side. And it's a beautiful place. And really, it shows the, the, the vision of the university to say, where, where, where do they go in the, in the future and, and the collaborations that they are, they are, they are, they are working on, I think. Those, those, I think, were the, my best memories, and also, also my classmates, because it was we were the first class to 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 graduate in, in development practice at UP, and really, it was an exciting experience. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Newton. Uh, Rosemary, uh, so sorry to have lost you earlier. There was a question that came for you um, on Slido that was actually asking, uh, previously has been warning that Africa is yet to see the worst from COVID-19. How prepared do you think African governments are should the worst come? Uh, for us, for example, in Kenya, I, I was trying to say before the internet rudely interrupted uh, that uh, we have opened, we are trying to re resume economic activities, but uh, 
the numbers are still gradually going up. So it's not known mm. how this will play out. And you know, the issue is the as you open Nairobi, which is the capital, people are rushing from here to the, the villages. So we don't know now how these numbers are really going to, to change with this open. Okay. But so far, I think the predictions for Africa have not come to pass. If you look at Europe, you look at South America, for example, Brazil, look at UK, look at US, Africa is still being a, well favored by the Lord, I should say, because really what they had said it could be never was. Yeah. Yes. And then there's this question yes. I'm seeing here about education. For us in the in Kenya, the schools were shut. Up to today, they are still shut. And yesterday, the Minister of uh, Education, the CS for Education, said the primary schools and the secondary schools will open in January next year. That means a whole year has gone by. And I believe even the colleges might have to do a whole year out so that they start at the same place. That's what we are seeing. The schools are still closed up to today as we speak. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosemary. Um, Minister Yvonne, would you like to add on the impact of the education in Namibia? Yeah, just to say that in Namibia, you know, we've been fortunate in that we've we've opened up that space. The only uh, students that are now being negatively affected are the localized ones. What we've done is we've staggered our uh, opening up. Um, and so every two weeks we are opening up and by the third would have a full complement of our school system in full swing. Uh, you know, and we are hoping that what we have seen in, in the area that has been localized and restricted, if we don't see that kind of rise in cases and we don't find community transmission because we haven't, we've only had sporadic transmission in other parts of the country. Um, if that continues, I think there's a real chance that our, our, our learners would be able to still make up for, for this academic year. If we find that in other parts of the country, there's community transmission, I think Namibia may have to rethink whether or not it wants to um, still continue, try and catch up for, for the 2020 academic year. But for now, um, things are working according to plan as far as the Ministry uh, of Education is concerned. Okay, thank you so much for that input, uh, Minister Yvonne. So I guess just in closing, um, Mr. Chinedu, could you also perhaps share what is your fondest memory of the University of Pretoria, your time there? Yeah, uh, so I did the master's uh, in human rights and democratization at the Center for Human Rights at the Faculty of Law in 2009. Uh, and I think uh, it's still a very fond memory because there were 30 persons in my class from, I think, 15 nationalities. And um, we've built a bond that has survived, um, you know, the last 10 years. Um, just last Saturday, we all did a, a, a Zoom call, you know, 10 years after the LLM was still in touch. So it's, 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 it's delightful to you know, be part of a network of people, professionals spread across the world doing different things. You know. uh, you're able to share notes, uh, you know, come share ideas, you know, and just know that you have a family you know, across Africa. It's, it's an incredible thing. Yes. I, thank you so much. I, thank you so much. Just. Can I quickly? I, I was yes, wondering Minister. where. I know, yes, I was wondering where I know Chinedu from. Uh, he's from my the junior, center. He's my junior on that program because uh, you know I was. We were <laughs> we were actually the second intake of of the group, so it was fresh. We were near pioneering it. There was a you know the two thousand group was there. What I really liked is. You know, because we were coming from universities that were not well resourced at that time. So University of Pretoria Library was really mana in heaven, yeah. uh, from heaven. And then the second thing <laughs> is because we were senior students, because we were senior students, you know, we had our own little houses um, in Hatfield. 
uh, that was awesome. But the greatest thing is to have 25 other African intellectuals in the same room. And, and we were very protected, uh, you know, in, in terms of being exposed uh, to each other, but also to the environment in, in Pretoria. So some of my fondest memories um, in 2001 was really the interaction and, and the quality uh, of exposure that that program uh, gave us. You know, we were exposed to other universities on the continent, Makerere, Legon in Ghana, uh, University of the Western Cape, and people could choose where they wanted to go to. And then, of course, that famous trip, as far as I'm concerned, to uh, Rwanda, Gigali, uh, to experience uh, what has happened post-genocide. So that really was an awesome experience at the University of Pretoria. I'm really grateful uh, for what I've, what I've learned there. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, uh, Minister Yvonne. It's very great to hear that everybody had some really good memories from the University of Pretoria. And that even though uh, you're all in different parts of the world right now, different parts of the continent, it's still great that everybody shares that same philosophy of some or other memory. Thank you so much. That then wraps up the questions that I had for of you. Uh, I think right now we can quickly do the last poll for the evening, uh, which is, did you find the discussion today insightful? Uh, the first one being, yes, I found it insightful, or no, I did not. Uh, so thank you so much to everyone for joining today's session. Make sure not to miss the next session that will be taking place on Wednesday. That is the 15th of July from 12 p.m. until 1 p.m. That is South African time. Uh, these discussions will be centered around the topic of job seekers, how to build your career strategy in today's job market. Uh, so today's event was, of course, brought to you by the University of Pretoria's alumni relations team, whom we're very thankful to. And also, we'd love to hear your opinions on the event. Uh, how did you find it? Whether you found it informative? Was it helpful? And if so, please, can you make sure to also complete that when you do the final poll on Slido? But that then wraps up the discussion. Mr. Chinedu, thank you so much. Dr. Rosemary, I really appreciate you. Mr. Newton, and of course, Minister Yvonne, thank you so much. You all shared so much insightful information from your different parts of Africa. Thank you so much. So now I'll hand over to...